Now, the UKIP leader has warned the terror threat in the United Kingdom could be added to by the migrant crisis in the Mediterranean. This week, the EU agreed a deal, you'll remember, to relocate tens of thousands of people who arrived in Italy and Greece and other countries to other European nations. Meanwhile, in Calais, hundreds of illegal migrants try to hide in lorries crossing the channel. Well, Nigel Farage joins me now. Very good morning to you, Mr. Morning. Farage. I mean, first of all, let's just focus on the thoughts we have with those bereaved families as a result of the atrocity that's been carried out in Tunisia. Yeah, horrific. And from what I hear, there are still families in Britain who don't know whether their relatives are alive, dead, in hospital. So, I mean, truly, truly shocking. Uh, of course, we have to face up to one thing. It isn't just in, it's not just in Tunisia that things like this happen. Uh, we do face the real prospect of it happening here again. Mm, and, and this is the point, as I've been discussing, many other people have been discussing, is that when you get what's uh, termed a lone wolf like this uh, operating in, in such yeah. a manner, it's, it's very, very difficult to either anticipate or deal with it. Yeah, very difficult. Uh, however, the one positive thing I can say is we have not had an attack of this nature on British soil for a very, very long time compared to other countries, France, Belgium, etc. And it, it leads me to conclude uh, that our security services, who are currently arresting one suspected terrorist every single day, are doing a very good job. Mm. But they say, even they say, well, look, if it's particularly if it is an individual yeah. who gets their hands on an automatic weapon, it's very hard for us to see that coming. Well, that's true, although people who go down that route generally there's a pattern of build up through social media and other things and that's why we're doing as well as we are i mean there are 300 people in britain who've been to syria and have fought in that conflict and been brutalized and are back in our community so i'm concerned about that and and and, and i do think that our security services need the power uh, and need the resources you know to effectively tackle it but my real concern is that that is have said they will flood the european continent with half a million jihadist fighters and you see the boats coming across the Mediterranean, and the EU has decided we must, we must be compassionate. We must say to everybody that arrives on the shores of Italy or the shores of Greece, you can stay inside the EU. Already we've seen a photograph of one of the suspects from the previous Tunisian massacre. Now, people say, oh, well, Nigel, don't exaggerate. They won't send half a million. Suppose they send 5,000. Supposing 5,000 jihadists use this route to get into Europe. And my concern is that we, as a country, can argue that were opted out of the EU's common asylum policy, but effectively, as we saw in Calais this week, people can either come illegally and have very little chance of being caught, or if the Italians lose patience, because the north of Europe is not cooperating in terms of sharing the burden of all these people that are coming, all the Italians have to do is give people European passports and then they're free to go anywhere. So, well, so I'm, 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 I'm worried about our position in this. Would you say some already have? Uh, and the numbers that have already arrived, the thousands that have already arrived? It would be surprising if some already hadn't. And as I say, one of the suspects from the previous Tunisian massacre was seen uh, getting off a boat in Sicily. But uh, we've got plenty of uh, threat emanating from within. We, you know, you mentioned, <coughs> we mentioned 7-7 yeah. and other, other attacks that have taken place here. There's, there's an existing threat already within the United Kingdom, and there's just an estimate, isn't there, of the number of people, British people, who've been fighting for Islamic State and its offshoots mm. who are now back on these shores. It amounts to several hundreds. Yeah, I mean, my argument was that anyone that went to fight in Syria for IS should have, should have their passports taken from them. You know, if we know that somebody has been and engaged, engaged in that activity, why on earth would we want them back in our country? Well, that was one of the threats I remember being made by the, by the Home Secretary. Ah, yeah, but that happen. was a general election. You know, all sorts of promises get made during general elections, often in response on subjects like this to what UKIP say first. Uh, but I don't see any evidence of that being put into place. I digress ever so slightly here, but people talking now, as, as we always do, about um, you mustn't give in to the terrorists, you've got to stand up to them. Uh, I was reading, uh, you, you wrote uh, in, was it the Mail on Sunday yeah. uh, this morning, about you've, uh, you were thinking of going on holiday to Kenya. Of course, it's had, uh, it's had some terrorist atrocities itself, and uh, you're, gonna, you're not going to go there. Well, I was are, gonna, are you giving in to terrorism? Well, I was going to go deep sea fishing. Uh, way out in the Indian Ocean, and of course Somalia is the bordering country, and I just thought, you know what, I don't want to take the risk. I mean, and, and I think actually, and it may be desperately unfair on a country like Tunisia, for argument's sake, who are, after the Arab Spring, one of the countries that appeared to be doing quite well, it may be desperately unfair 
to Tunisia, but I mean, you know, if your teenage daughter said to your dad, I'm off to Tunisia with my mates for a week, what would you say? Well, I'd say no. Mm, but, you know, they have deliberately targeted, let's talk about Tunisia, deliberately targeted one of their main sources of, of foreign income, and with that previous attack in March on the Bardo Museum and this, you're right. I mean, we've seen the cancellations, we've yeah. seen the people flooding yeah. back, but that is giving in to them, isn't it? They're, they're um, succeeding. No, it's not giving in. We all make personal choices, and if we think, we, if, if we think we're going to put ourselves in harm's way, we generally try to avoid it. Those decisions are easy. The tough decision is, is our government going to stand up and say to Mr Juncker and the European Commission that you're making a terrible mistake with the Mediterranean, you need to look at what the Australians did back in 2008 when they faced exactly the same problem, boatloads of people coming to Australia, boats sinking, thousands of people drowning, and the Australians decided they'd send a message which was, you will not via this route make Australia your home. The boats stop coming, the drowning stop too. So it's British policy not really joined up. So we've got Royal Naval vessels in the Mediterranean picking up people who are in yep. danger of drowning, delivering them then mainly to Italian shores. If they make their way up to Calais, then they're, they're not allowed in. If that was the other way around, if the Italians were picking up yes. loads of people and delivering them to the Isle of Wight, we wouldn't be we, very happy, no, would we'd, we? We'd be furious, wouldn't we? So we're not, we don't know what we're doing. And we have this odd relationship with Europe, of course, because we're members of the European Union, yet we comfort ourselves, we're opted out of their common asylum policy, and yet indirectly these people can come anyway. In a sense, it takes us back to the big debate in British politics over the next 18 months. What is Britain's role? You know, are we to have an independent foreign policy? Are we to control our borders ourselves? Or somehow, are we happy to accept that these big decisions get taken at, you know, in mean, Brussels, effectively. Mm. And the big question, I mean, talking about the uh, EU referendum and the negotiations beforehand, uh, have you uh, found out satisfactorily, to your own satisfaction, what the Prime Minister will actually be asking for during these renegotiations? Well, he, he made it clear before the election that there had to be fundamental treaty change to satisfy his demands because the British relationship with the EU was in need of reform. I was at the summit this week. I know it's been rather overshadowed by the horrific events in Tunisia. I was at the summit, and that initial request of his for treaty reform met with unanimity in the room. All 27 said no, it isn't going to happen. So we are not going to have treaty change, we're not going to have fundamental reform, and it looks at the moment that the, the renegotiations will become a technocratic backroom process. Yeah, they'll talk about you know benefits for migrant workers for the first few months or whatever, but in terms of Britain's big relationship, should Parliament have a veto over European laws? Should our Supreme Court be supreme? Uh, and can we control our borders? It looks like none of those things are even going to be discussed. Mr Farage, good to see you. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed.